Hi everyone, this is uh, Howard Mann. Welcome to the STR webinar. So we have three of us that have cases this week, so I'm going to start off this week and show you a couple cases. So let me move that out of the way and I presume everyone can see my screen okay. So this is a comparison exam in a patient at a time when things were okay. The context is oncology and this patient has a hematologic malignancy. And I'm showing you the images up here just to indicate that he has a right subcutaneous port with a catheter going into the jugular vein in the usual place and then going inferiorly. So he's got that for administration of chemotherapy. So this is at a time when things up here look just fine. So now I'll go forward in time to sometime later. And when we take a look at that area, at this point in time, I will tell you that his, let me just verify that, that the catheter was removed and I'm withholding a little bit of information for the time being, but that's where the subcutaneous port and the catheter used to be. And keep your eye on the right jugular vein. There it looks okay, but soon enough as we traverse the thoracic indent, you will see that it's lumen narrows quite substantially from there to there. And instead of a nice opacified lumen, we see abnormality related to the opacity, the uh, opacification of the lumen, as well as some um, abnormality related to the wall, as well as quite a bit of abnormality related to right brachiocephalic vein as we go down towards its junction with the left brachiocephalic vein. So the lumen is narrowed. The wall undoubtedly, I think, is inflamed, and there may also be some abnormal tissue around that vessel. So let me show you here the lungs, and I will tell you that these opacities that are new, those rounded things are, are new. So those have developed in this person's context, and certainly at a time when he has a fever, he has that finding. I'm not sure if he had symptoms related to the neck, but certainly that is very consistent with vascular inflammation and these new rounded opacities, certainly consistent with septic embolism. So we have a problem with where the port used to be and the vein in which it used to go, consistent with infection. So let me go forward in time. That is the 4th of September, and I'll just show you perhaps the coronal image from about eight days later to show you what's happened to that right jugular vein over time. Actually, let me show you the coronal of the neck, which shows the abnormality even more. So here we go, and you can see this is about where the jugular vein opacified is going to disappear and here, and I'll move this up, you can see that there is really just a little bit of contrast medium in that distended vein, but otherwise this portion of the jugular vein is distended with clot. So this certainly is consistent with infected thrombus involving the right jugular vein as well as the right innominate vein with septic embolism. So this is coagulase negative staph port infection, complicated infection with also you can see ultrasound findings consistent with infected thrombus of the jugular vein. So pretty dramatic case of that. Second turn is out. Second turn. All right. Can you folks still hear me? I'm I'm working in a place I don't usually work, so I want to make sure you can hear me. There's no problem. It's, it sounds fine. I can't right. even tell you're not. Okay. Next case is a um, pretty classic kind of situation where a patient with a history of Marfan syndrome, as it turns out, comes into hospital. 
And let me just show you the frontal and lateral projection of the chest. Sorry about that. Let me bring that in like this and like this and get this back to what it should look like, like that. So this patient's had uh, surgery to the spine but has Marfan syndrome. And certainly in that context, acute chest pain, acute aortic syndrome, one thinks about aortic dissection. And I always teach my residents that that portion of the aorta that we're often very interested in, which is the aortic root, that portion between aortic annulus and sinotubular junction, is really buried in the mediastinum. And you can stare at this forever, but you won't appreciate the dilatation of the aortic root that is present here, and that may be present in patients with Marfan syndrome particularly, because it simply doesn't contact lung to produce any abnormal mediastinal lung interface. So this patient will be imaged for acute aortic syndrome in the usual manner. And quickly scrolling through there, we'll be looking for, of course, the aorta itself. Here is the dilated aortic root. No findings of acute intramural hematoma on these images. But here's the contrast. I'll make that big. And we'll see a pretty typical type A aortic dissection. So we can see that the dissection flap is located in aortic root. There's aortic valve, but the aortic root is large. The dissection flap is there. Of course, the sinotubular junction will be faced by virtue of the dilatation of the root to start off with. And then as we go higher, we can see that it goes on, goes on. The true lumen is rather small there. And then when we get to about here, we can see there is communication here between true lumen and false lumen. And then in terms of the brachycephalic vessels, here is the clavian, left carotid, here's in nominate. And if we just go back a little bit, we can see the intermomedial flap in relationship to the origin of the nominate artery, close to where there is a fenestration there. And then, of course, the aortic dissection continues inferiorly for for a distance. So pretty typical acute aortic syndrome. Now I'm going to show you, just out of interest, uh, what they found at surgery and how that correlates with what we see on imaging. And this is sort of interesting in itself. So you can see here by description that type A dissection, tear located in the aortic root. The tear involved the origin of right innominate artery, aortic arch was small. So they were able to spare the valve, no problem there. So you have to take care of the aortic root and you have to take care of the ascending tubular aorta. And you can see there that they had to use two grafts to do that. They did uh, ascending aorta and root replacement and had to replace the innominate artery. So here, it's kind of interesting how they describe that. You can see here that they, for a time, in this paragraph thought about the frozen elephant trunk technique, which I showed about two weeks ago, which some surgeons do at the time of repair of an acute type A aortic dissection to try and deal with future problems involving the descending aorta. But, and I don't know what small too small is, but they decided not to do that technique. So they used one graft uh, for replacement of ascending aorta, kind of a hemi-arch, attach the innominate artery to that, and then to deal with the aortic root, they use something called a valsalva graft. So this portion of the valsalva graft right there is intended to kind of mimic the shape of the sinuses of valsalva. So you put that in, and then you attach the coronary arteries with their buttons to that, as you can see there. And then this valsalva graft is then anastomose to the other graft replacing the ascending aorta. So kind of a nice correlation here between the pathology and the nature of the surgery in this particular patient to deal with the type A dissection. Any comments about that, anyone? All right, let me go on. This one is interesting, let's see. All right, this patient came to 
us from an outside hospital. So the initial set of images look like this. So August 20, chest radiograph shows multifocal, multilobar opacities in both lungs. And I'll show you the images from the outside hospital. Sorry about that. Let me go and do that. And you will see the extent and the location of the pathology. You'll recognize immediately that this is a necrotizing pneumonia. It's a bilateral necrotizing process. Some of the areas of necrosis are producing fairly rounded cavitary opacities, pleural fluid, but certainly depending on the context, one would think of various causes of necrotizing pneumonia. And in a patient with a history of drug abuse, as this patient was, one would certainly think of septic embolism. So the patient had the non-contrast CT on the outside, and I will show you now the contrast CT that we have here. Initially, I'm going to show you the chest CT. The patient's obviously very ill. You'll see how this has progressed terribly over those days. Now we're just losing parenchyma, so a very aggressive necrotizing pneumonia, septic embolism picture in this person. And there's a pneumothorax, pleural fluid, a pleural drain looks rather awful. So now I'm going to show you images from the chest CT to show you one interesting thing first, which initially was not observed. So I'll come back to that. But just let me show you if I can find it again. Uh, one interesting thing, and I need to try and find it again, because there is this here in relation to a pulmonary artery segment, which is pretty continuous with that, but there's certainly intraluminal pathology in that location. And there was another filling defect in the artery, and I can't remember where that was, but certainly this looks like embolism. I think this patient with a history of septic embolism, one would look for tricuspid valve endocarditis and think that this represents embolism of vegetations rather than bland embolism from VTE. So if we look at the heart, we can see we don't have sufficient contrast medium and right atrium and right ventricle to really show that valve at all well. And what's interesting here is that the CT was done very close to the same time, but you can see from the CT that we have contrast medium now in right atrium and right ventricle very nicely on the abdominal CT portion of the exam. And it's on that portion of the exam that we see the large vegetations on the tricuspid valve very nicely. So that's one thing I think to keep in mind if you're worried about diagnosing septic embolism. And certainly this patient was known to have that on the basis of ultrasound before. But if you're looking for it, you really need to have more delayed images when the atrium and the ventricle are nicely opacified in order to be able to see those large vegetations that nicely. So a nice case of infective endocarditis, vegetations, embolized vegetations to segments of pulmonary arteries and a terrible necrotizing pneumonia as well. Okay, I have one more, I think, to show you. This one's interesting, too. I'm going to withhold some history just at the beginning here. But at this point in time, going back to 2014, I will show you. And the finding I'm going to show you in a moment is related to left hemidiaphragm. But I'm going to show you that just to show you that the left hemidiaphragm is okay. There's no abnormal opacity in the basal left hemithorax. So keep that image in mind. And let me bring alongside that an image that was done sometime later. So let me bring in 15 alongside it. And actually, let me bring up the coronal from 2015 because that is going to be nice too. So here we go. So let me just show you. If you scroll through the axial, and you're shooting right down here, um, you won't see very much. 
But I'm going to show you in a moment another follow-up where this contour abnormality, which is really subtle here, becomes quite apparent. So let me go forward now, and I'm going to leave that one up and bring a later one up. Let's see what the time difference here is. Okay, 15 to 16. All right, so now we see, looking at the left hemidiaphragm here, a bulge. It's very focal. It was probably present there, but now it's larger. And if you look at that, you'll think perhaps that there's some liver going across, and maybe some liver is protruding into the basal left hemithorax. That was described as focal abnormality, eventration, words like that. It wasn't really all put together. But let's see if I have any additional images. No, I don't. So this is the finding there. It's evolved over time. So now I'm going to go back and bring in the axial here and bring in the axial from the prior 2014. And if you're, it's really important here to have the history. Let me take that away. For some reason, that's really interesting that it doesn't want to unsync. Don't know why. Let's see if I can get that to go away. Okay, so here we have the time when that diaphragm was okay. And some of you may have noticed that the spleen is gone. So that's a clue as to something going on there that might be related to this focal bulge. And the history, of course, here is really important. So this patient has a history of ovarian cancer. And soon after this exam was obtained, she underwent surgery with a very extensive debulking procedure. And undoubtedly, if you look at the surgery that was performed, this is an iatrogenic focal left hemidiaphragm hernia. Um, there was tumor on the diaphragm, tumor on both hemidiaphragms, but I think undoubtedly this is a focal diaphragm injury from the surgery itself, not a metastasis. So history is really important and very helpful to work things out. So there's the context and here's the finding right there. All righty. Howard, do you think it's just a herniated liver at this point and not, um, not tumor recurrence? Yeah, I there? think the liver's coming over quite a bit over to the left of the midline. I think it has the same gesture as liver. Yeah. It's pooching through there, right there. Yeah. I mean, it could also be splenic tissue. I mean, you never know if they or drop some tissue, tissue maybe. The diaphragm. But I think given what I see in terms of the surgery, where they've resected a bunch of lesions, that you know, if they take the spleen away, just the whole spleen by itself, presumably that came out okay. But if they resected some actual left hemidiaphragm lesions, then I think it's perhaps more likely that that's just a small injury from, that, from the surgery, I think. I've, I've seen a little iatrogenic hernias like this before along the, the right diaphragm. Side, I think you've shown some things on the right. Yeah, we've shown a couple cases on both sides. This is, I think, the first one I've seen after this kind of surgery. I've seen it after kidney surgery, nephrectomies. I've mm -hmm. seen it after removal of a liver tumor, David, when you've shown some of those. I don't think I've seen this before in the context of a debulking surgery right. for ovarian cancer. I think this is my first in that context, but I think it makes great sense. And I've seen one after a um, elbow removed and the LVAD was put in the upper abdomen. They went through ah, the diaphragm ah, into the, okay. the apex. Of, so when they pulled that cannula out, they they left the potential for a um, hernia later. Okay. All right. Very good. So who's ready? I could show some. Okay, David. I'll switch over to you. If I can get to my control property, which is here. Okay, there we go. Do people see a radiograph? Let me know when a radiograph oh, is know. here. Do we have radiograph? Yeah, we do now. Very good. So unfortunately, I only have a frontal view for this. I don't have a lateral view to help, but there's a little um, puffiness of the upper mediastinum here. 
and the trachea of course there's a little bit of rotation but the trachea seems to be going off a little bit to the right and it turns out there's a reason for all of this there is a bulky uh, tumor here pretty homogeneous tumor in the upper mediastinum um, it does seem to be associated with esophagus here although it's very eccentric and this was biopsied from the esophagus and this turns out to be an esophageal glioma, a big bulky upper mediastinal tumor like this. So on the on the sagittal view here, you can see the potential for our being able to pick up something on lateral view in terms of anterior displacement of the trachea here by this mass here. And this this nicely shows the relationship with the esophagus with air below and some air above, and then in the middle, the air is uh, obliterated from that. From the lumen. So esophageal lyomyoma biopsy proved. Mm, very nice. And then here's a fellow with an abnormal chest radiograph and it looked like this for a while. Um, a denser lesion here in the right apex but the hint that there's something around it, you know, just uh, smudginess up here and then denser smudge here on both sides at the level of the hyla and maybe some right paratracheal lymphadenopathy, which is helpful in this. I think I'm going to have the CT come up here. So um, so let's, let's look first of all at the um, five millimeter sections here. And we see that we have this dense consolidation here around airways. And we have some more ground glassy stuff out here and over here, and back here, sort of along fissures. Um, so this just shows the benefit of thin sections. The thinner, the better. So here's the same, the same imaging here, same level, but with 1.25 millimeter thick slices. And now you can see that the main abnormality is not ground glassy, but it's really fine nodules that have become confluent to varying degrees. We have a very nice galaxy sign here with this dense central core and then the, the nodules clustered around it. And again, we have it's basically a nodular abnormality forming along fissures back here. We do have a very discreet, well-formed mediastinal and hyalur lymphadenopathy with very clean margins of the nodes, characteristic of sarcoid, which is what this case is. So mm. there's subcranial lymphadenopathy, hyalur lymphadenopathy, not, not shown against vessels mm. here, but de definitely present. And a um, very nice, I think, galaxy sign here of sarcoidosis. I like the way that um, a couple small airways are traversing that large opacity undisturbed. Right. So there you see a little air bronchogram effect too. So oh, air yeah. bronchogram on CT and sarcoid lymphoma. Very nice. Okay. Those are things one thinks of, right? Okay. Um, now let me show you a few uh, little adventures here with um, with um, with port. So here is a frontal view on this person. <clears throat> who has a port catheter in place and the needle is not going into the circle. So this is bad. We called them up about, about this and they said they had good blood return when they sucked back and so they were not inclined to, uh, to, to view this as abnormal. But I've been burned by having, having these needles go in beside the port, not in the port, and then lead to extravasation and tissue necrosis. And the other thing to notice about this is, let me, let me mag it up here, is that um, there are some letters put on this that indicate that this port catheter is capable of, of taking contrast on an injected contrast for a CT scan. And although the letters are upside down, if we rotate this whole thing here, which I can do, uh, we should be able to, when we get it properly oriented, to be able to read it left to right. And it should not be a mirror image of normal. So you don't let your C backwards. You may have to rotate the thing here in the plane, but when you get it unrotated, it should not read as a mirror image. It should read CT in the normal left to right manner. So that can be a clue. So at any rate, this needle was um, revised over the next few days, and now you can see that the needle goes into the circle. So this is reassuring. And I don't think there was any complication of extravasation, but it's very good to reposition this. Okay. and. Um, so let me show you this case. And here is uh, a port that was placed way back, I think, in 2013. And let's examining this port. Again, it reads CT 
and if we uh, rotate into conventional position, it reads CT. It's not a mirror image of CT. It's a perfectly good CT. Same person a while later, and they were having difficulty accessing the port. And now let's um, let's mag this up here. Um, increase the contrast. And if we um, I'm, let me rotate this for you, and we rotate the thing and we mag it up, and now we recognize that CT is backwards, so it's a mirror image. And this indicates that the port has flipped over, and it, when they attempt to inject this port, they actually hit the hard back surface of the port, not the soft rubber part in the front. So this thing has flipped over under the skin, and unrecognized, this could lead to what looks like good needle placement, with the needle projected in the circle, but obviously it's not penetrating the rubber part. It's not a good location and you don't want to infuse if the port has been flipped over like this. So be very alert to the letters should be resolvable by rotation if necessary, but you should be able to read left to right. It shouldn't be a mirror image C. It's hard to tell if it's a mirror image T, but you can definitely tell if it's a mirror image C. So uh, this led to a port complication. The port was not in, in a, a, injectable because the port had flipped over under the skin. Now, the interesting thing about that one, I recognize that because I think um, this, is a, this is manufactured by BARD, and it's a BARD power port. And I'm going to make the assumption that BARD, when they manufactured it, um, did it in a way that when it's properly positioned on the frontal projection, the C and T are, as you indicate, kind of backwards or upside down. Whereas other manufacturers, the C and the T read properly. So it's this particular port that's triangular shaped, which is a barred power port, has that feature. But some other ports, the, the C and the T do read properly when it's properly positioned. So it's a yeah. peculiarity of barred power port. And that it's upside down. Ports. Yeah. So but, 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 but with the location, it shouldn't be a mirror image. So. Right. Okay. So the so yeah, it's a little harder. To, you have to read things upside down. But as a radiologist, I've gotten used to doing that. But you don't you don't want to encounter a mirror image, as in this case. So rotate if necessary, and make sure it's not a mirror image. So if you so, can you can yeah. we see that on the lateral? Are you going to show the lateral to see whether we can tell the lateral? Things yeah, the lateral is a, it's disappointing because um, can't really see it. Needles in plate, oh, not in. You see it oh, is that is that catheter coming into the back side of it? Is that helpful or not? I'm sorry. That, so, um, yeah, that's a good point. If you oh. if you think this is a good lateral, you can recognize that the uh, tubing here is against the skin, and the the non-tubing part is external. So let's see what that looked like before when it was properly placed. Here you can see you can't see it very well, but the the uh, tubing is in front of it. It's anterior. Uh, so, yeah, if you were lucky, you could if you it out this, on this one too. Okay, so um, scrutinize those ports. Make sure the needle is centered over the circle, and um, sometime and and look for the lettering being uh, acceptable. So here's a person with diffuse lung disease. I think fairly mild symptoms for the degree of diffuse lung disease. It's been there for a while, uh, months, I think. And this person has one of the nicest examples of ground glass with crazy paving reticular overlay. Nice, sharp margination against uninvolved lobules. So nice geographic margination. And this is alveolar prognosis. Um, and this person was transferred here and was treated with lavage. I don't know whether they tried you know, IG, um, what is it, GMCSF therapy on this person. All right, they went to lavage, and we have a picture of the uh, lavage eight here, one, two, and three, showing a whole lot of crud that they lavaged out of the lungs here, and then it seems to get a little bit thinner as we go. And the, typically, they'll use 30 liters of warm saline um, and wash out one lung at a time. Three so, zero? I'm sorry? Three zero liters, thirty. Three zero liters is what they used to use. Yeah, of warm saline. So, so you don't want to do this if you're in a country with a saline shortage. 
Okay. And um, so here's a person with a um, cough and a very discreet um, lesion here, very well-behaved looking lesion in a lower lobe or a lo lower lung bronchus here on this CT. So it's filling the airway. And I don't have any pictures to show you about whether there was some atelectasis associated with it or not, but this is a very good lesion in a fairly young patient here for a carcinoid tumor. It was biopsied and their biopsy results were typical carcinoid. Then they came back uh, after coring it out, relieving obstruction, draining secretions and things like that. They like to core these things out, drain, get inf inf infection out under control before they go back for more surgery. <clears throat> so the person then had uh, a resection and at that point, they recognized that there were actually uh, about nine um, per high-powered field of um, of chromosomal of um, of mitoses. I was trying to say metastases of mitoses. Lymph nodes were negative, but they ended up revising the diagnosis from typical carcinoid to atypical carcinoid based on that rate of mitosis. So uh, this looks like a very well-behaved lesion. It actually is uh, a little bit more dangerous in terms of being atypical rather than a typical carcinoid. And um, here is a, another case with uh, some lower lung atelectasis. You can see it's all confined posteriorly back here. It looks like a right lower lobe collapse. And this person had uh, a CT scan that shows uh, a less well-defined lesion obstructing at this location here and the lower lobe, you know, it seems to be an exobronchial component to this. The lower lobe is collapsed posteriorly here. And uh, this was resected and this was a typical carcinoid. So this looks potentially like a larger lesion and maybe more extensive lesion with an exobronchial component as well, but this turned out to be a better histology. So typical carcinoid in this person. Perhaps there's, um, I would wonder if the patient was infected, there's a little bit of pleural fluid and, yeah. and consolidation. Perhaps it's a post-obstructive infection in part. Yes, and this was another one in which they corded out and then waited for infection and secretions to get under control and then went back in for the, for the resection. Uh, and they did a lobectomy on that one. So um, let me show you this uh, case of a defibrillator placed uh, this is back in in April, and this person came back to clinic then having um, pulled the leads out considerably. So this right ventricular lead now has been pulled back into the right atrium. The right atrial lead is shorter, and there's all this twisting here from twiddling. And also notice that the pulse generator has flipped over. It's like a port. It's flipped under the skin. So the flat surface was against the axilla here, and now the flat surface is medial. So the, the pulse generator has flipped, and you can see that flipping in that direction around the long axis of is what would, would twist the leads in this configuration. So this is an example of twiddler syndrome. Um, and uh, here's another person who um, twiddled, and here we have that same twisting of the leads. And this lead has been completely withdrawn it's not in the heart at all anymore. It's not even very much in the subclavian vein. So this has been pulled back almost to the pulse generator. So uh, this seems to be a, a raft of uh, twitchy people with a twiddling out there. And then finally, here is this case. These are all in the last couple of weeks. We have initial placement here and then subsequent um, findings. At this point, when they noticed that they, they were not capturing the uh, left ventricular uh, lead. So you can see that the sh there's a shorter course of the right ventricular lead here. The atrial lead seems to be in the same position as before, but the lead for pacing the LV from a posterior cardiac vein has now pulled back out of the coronary sinus into the right atrium. Ooh. And in this case, in this case the, the, uh, the direction of twiddling seems to be rotation of the unit rather than flipping it around the long axis. So this is in the short axis flip that we're doing here. This is y-axis rotation, and you can see that it's resulted in coiling of the lead behind the pulse generator compared to 
before we had just one loop there or two loops there and now we've got several loops that have succeeded in extracting these leads uh, to a considerable degree. So three twiddlers in the last um, three weeks. That's really interesting. And I've always wondered about the twiddler syndrome because I have this notion that I'm not sure that, that all these patients actually really fiddle with the pacemaker. I wonder if the pocket is just capacious and just the activity of daily living I don't know, putting on your clothes, taking off your clothes, doing right. stuff around the house. Because it's hard to believe that, that individuals actually sit around watching TV and twiddle mm -hmm. the pacemaker. I think that those pockets are just capacious and it just basically happens in, in the activities of daily living. I have no idea whether that's true or not. But it seems weird that people, so many, because we've all got cases that really twiddle like that. Really? So... Um I will check, but I, I think you're right, Howard. I think that sometimes it's just a mechanical problem. Um, and then we noticed that there was a problem uh, in years past of um, at the installation of a pacemaker or a defibrillator in a woman with uh, pendulous breasts who was in, of course, supine position on the table for installation of the device. And they would put it in and everything would be in proper location. And then the woman would stand up and the breasts would gravitationally pull down yes. uh, from the position they were when they were sort of floating up in the axillae, they would go downward and they would actually extract the lead just by moving. So that, so I think that, you know, at least two of these patients are women and maybe all three, I was going to go back and check, but, um, and so I think that the women have more, uh, if, especially if they have, you know, pendulous breasts and stuff like that may have more of a, tendency to have these things move around. But I agree with you. I think that's not always, uh, it's not always the direct action of the person in doing this. It could be the mechanics too of really yeah. other. Yeah. Right. So you saw those just in a few weeks? Wow. Yes. Seems to be twiddlers really around here. Okay, those are the those are the cases for this week. All right. Those are fantastic. Thank you. Seth, are you still ready? Are you okay now? I think that uh, we may have lost Seth, I think. Let's see. So Seth was around, but I think he may have had to go somewhere. So I don't see him on the list, David, at the moment. Okay. So... Well, you know, we had 45 good minutes, so. <laughs> we call it a day? We'll call it a day, and we'll come up with some more another time. Very good. Thanks, Howard. Thank you. Okay, thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye for now. See you next time. Bye.